So if you have your Bibles, open to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 25 to verse 28 today, those verses there, as we continue in the series that we started a few weeks ago called Different. And what we're talking about is not the different that is defined by the world that we live in, which is our desire in, the, in our culture and the world is to be unique, be special, be different. And all of us watch the trends in our culture, which is the more we try to be different, the more we end up being the same. Because we try to be different by looking at people who are different, and then when you try to be different like them, you're the same. Anybody get what I'm saying? And so we end up all living the same narrative, the same old story, but when you read through the scriptures, you realize that Jesus calls his people, he calls people who are following him, to live different than the world. Not to make yourself different, but to embrace a, a different identity that allows you to live a different rhythm of life than those around you. Not that you're better, but that you're different. And so we've talked about some different things about what that looks like. Last week we talked about the different way God has for us to live. And today in the verses we're going to look at, we're going to look at that there's a different truth that we're to live by that is different than kind of the, I'll use the analogy, the ocean that we swim in since I'm surrounded by coral, or the world that we live in or the air that we breathe. It's a different truth, a different reality that God has set forth for people who follow him than the environment that we live in. And so we're gonna talk about that today because the concept of truth is extremely important. And it isn't, it isn't just a matter of like, do I tell the truth or do I tell a lie? There's something deeply embedded in the, in the truth conversation, which by the way, when we get to the fall, we're gonna actually spend a whole series talking about truth and deception because it's such a key element in our lives that we don't even realize is going on every single day. But this idea of understanding truth is this, is what, what is what is true or what is truth? It's when we're willing to be honest and be willing to deal with our stuff, which means what's inside, what's broken, what's there, comes to the surface. There's a, there's a truth that's there when we bring to the surface. That, that is called authenticity. And part of being a follower of Jesus means that I don't hide, I don't play games, I'm authentic, I'm true, I'm transparent. But you and I live in a world that loves to lie. What is a lie? A lie tries to portray something different than the truth. It wants a certain reality to be reflected to those around it, but it doesn't reflect what's really going on inside. That's called hypocrisy. So the tension we live in between, uh, between truth and a lie is really this. It's the difference between authenticity and hypocrisy. And so we're going to kind of lean into that today and talk about that because the truth that God wants to bring to it for us is to help us to understand as a follower of Jesus, I live a life that doesn't say that I'm perfect, but it says that I'm authentic about who I am and where I am and what I'm walking through in my life as God begins to transform me. The reason this is so important is because whether we know it or not, we actually value hypocrisy in our culture. It is something that we actually would not use the term, but we do it all the time and we celebrate it. In fact, it's celebrated to the point of billions and billions and billions of dollars every year. It's called superhero movies. Now, I know I'm going to crush you on this, okay? They're, superhero movies are not bad. They're not sinful, okay? But almost every superhero movie is based on the same reality. It's somebody coming to grips with their humanity and their brokenness and trying to be something better, trying to be something different, trying to be something that doesn't actually reflect their brokenness. Batman's a perfect example. I love the Dark Knight trilogy, okay? I've always said that. If you like other ones, we'll pray for you, but okay. So the concept, the difference between Bruce Wayne and Batman. Well, who is Bruce Wayne? Bruce Wayne is an orphan who's got secrets and brokenness in his life, and he hasn't been able to reconcile that. Who's Batman? Batman is the savior of Gotham. He has what? He has power and ability way beyond what Bruce Wayne has. And so he lives in these two realities. Why? Because Batman can be everything that Bruce Wayne is not. And the whole concept is to not let people know that Bruce Wayne is actually Batman. And this, it's, if you've ever watched any of the Batman, you watch the exhausting reality of Bruce Wayne's life, which is how do I cover myself? How do I continue to tell the lie so nobody knows I'm Batman? And some of us, we live that life. Our life is exhausting because all we do is try to manage narratives around people to help them believe something that we want them to believe about us that really is not true. And it's exhausting. There's a different truth that God calls his people to live by that he's called us to be. So yes, can you be a superhero? Yes, but you cannot be a hypocrite in the process. Because then you're being what? You're being, in a sense, you're lying about who you are and what's going on inside of you. God does not work in secret and in darkness. God works in light and openness. And if you want him to work in your life, you have to live out authentically what's going on inside. It doesn't justify sin or brokenness. It's just honest about it. 
So with that concept in mind, let me read uh, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 28. But before that, I want to pray that God would work in our lives. And as well, I know there's a number of families who are down this week and have been down with COVID. It seems like we got another little wave going on here. And so we want to pray for God's healing on people's bodies. So would you pray, for me, pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that we get to be present here today, but Lord, we first ask for families who've been impacted by COVID this week. We pray your covering, your protection, and your healing on their bodies as they rest at home. And Lord, for us today, as we look into your word, we are convinced your Holy Spirit is here. You are at work in us. And so, Lord, you have something for us. You have something you want to say. You have something you want us to learn, and you have something that you want us to obey in our lives. So, Lord, would you allow those things to happen as we read your word and, and walk through it today in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ephesians 4, uh, the Apostle Paul writes this in verse 25. He says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So with those verses, we're going to start with these two, the, these two realities. We have hypocrisy on one side and authenticity on the other. So first four things out of this passage. How do you and I reject hypocrisy in our life? How do we go against the flow and the current of what we live in every single day? The first thing is this. You and I, in verse 25, we have to deal with our own deception. So it says this, Paul says, Therefore put off or put away falsehood which means expose the lies that we live out every single day. Stop playing the game of hypocrisy, which is trying to create some reality for people to believe about you that is not true. You have to start there. You have to let it go. You have to pull the mask off. You have to take the costume off. You have to be who you are. Again, not to justify brokenness or sin, but you have to be honest with it. Otherwise, you and I work really, really, really hard to be something that we're not. I think I've shared this before, but when we first moved to Newburgh, I don't, it wasn't even my idea. I think it was our youth pastor's idea. He said, we really, we want to do something to promote Easter. And so we got this idea that they'd stick me in a bunny suit. I'd go around Newburgh, our town there, and I was interviewing people in the bunny suit asking what they thought about Easter. And I thought, that's a great concept. And so we did it, but he said, you know what? That's not enough. I said, well, it's enough for me. He goes, well, it's not enough for me. I said, well, what's your idea? He goes, what if you went around the city and not only were you asking questions, you danced in the bunny suit all over town and I filmed you. I said, it's a great idea. There's just one problem. I don't dance. I could try, but it just don't look good. So he goes, no problem. I got it all set up. Another pastor friend he had who lived down in Eugene, which is about an hour and a half, hour and 45 away. He goes, the guy is a pastor, but he's a phenomenal dancer. He goes, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put you in the bunny suit and you're going to interview people, but then we're going to put him in the bunny suit and he's going to dance all over town. And he did it. And it was a huge hit. And this is what happened. It was so huge, people were blown away at my dancing skills. <laughs> and for four weeks, when we played videos, I literally, all the kids in their youth group came up to me and said, Pastor John, we want to see your moves. That's amazing. And I was honestly stuck. And this is what we did. We said, okay, well, we're not going to tell anybody what's really going on. They want to know who's in the bunny suit. And so I said, we'll do the big reveal on Easter, which we did. And I remember thinking, I don't want them to know. But here's the problem. We told them I was in the bunny suit, and then they came and thought, then he could really dance. And then I was like, oh, there's a part of me that my pride says, yeah, I want him really to think I could dance like that. And for a while, I played around in my head, do I really want to tell them? And then even to this day, guarantee, I was honest. I stood before the church, and I told them, I was the interviewer. I was not the one who was in the bunny suit dancing. And to this day, no joke, there are people who still think I can dance. But I remember when I finally got clear that I didn't have to feel this pressure of some young person walking to me, Pastor John, let me see your moves. I ain't got no moves. <laughs> but I remember the tension just a little bit. And finally, when I was able to like clear the deck and said, here you go, people. I am not a dancing bunny. I'm, this is me. There was a little bit of relief. Like, I don't have to pretend this lie anymore. Now, for some of you, that's a funny story. But for some of you, that's the life you live every day. The first thing that Paul says in this passage about rejecting hypocrisy is you have to put away falsehood, which means you got to put away the costume. You gotta put away the show, you gotta take off the mask, and you gotta live authentically who you are and be honest about your brokenness. That's the first step. Second thing in verse 26 is you have to deal with your resentment. So Paul says this, he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. So what he's saying is that reality is, is that you and I have, a, have an issue with anger, and anger always leads to resentment, and resentment always thrives in the darkness and hypocrisy. 
And this is the reality that we live. This is the way it works, especially in the body of Christ where it shouldn't. When we get offended with other people, instead of dealing with it, we get angry and anger moves to resentment and resentment hangs out in an offense and we distance ourselves from people. So we pretend to be nice around people, but then when we're not around them, what do we do? Because we're angry and we're bitter and resent them. We tell stories, we gossip, we stab them in the back. Now, no one's ever done that before, right? That's, that's something other churches down the street do, but not at Antioch. We all do this. We all live in this reality. Why? Because when we're angry, we, it turns to resentment because we do what with it? We hang on to it. It gets bitter. It gets worse. And here's the thing is what happens is offense and resentment are like a balloon that keeps getting expanded more and more and more. And eventually there is no more room for air and it explodes. That's what unresolved anger does. That's, when you, when, when this, that's what Paul's using the analogy. When the sun goes down, which means you go to bed angry, which means over and over again, you don't deal with your anger with the person you're angry at. It just gets worse and worse and worse until you explode. You explode that person, you explode at other people. What is that? That is hypocrisy. Why? Because you're not dealing with the resentment in your soul that's poisoning you towards a person. And so it's only hurting you. It's not hurting them. And what is Paul saying? What? If you're going to live outside of hypocrisy, you have to be willing to do what? You have to be willing to deal with the fact that we're humans and we offend each other. Because we'll get to it in a minute. Paul says, it's not a sin to be angry. It's what we do with the anger. Do we deal with it or do we just let it settle into our soul? Which leads to the third thing. And that is you and I have to be willing, verse 27, to deal with the devil. So he says, and give no opportunity to the devil. And this is one of the things that's interesting. You and I are convinced, and I think the enemy has been so successful in doing this. We think that the enemy is obvious in his tactics, and he's not. We think that when we encounter something that's demonic or from the devil, it's going to be absolutely obvious to us. We're going to know the difference between light and dark, good and evil. We're going to know the difference between Jesus and the devil. And that's a lie that we've all believed. Because his primary, primary means of working in our lives is not out front, it's behind the scenes. It's allowing the devil to get a foothold when you don't deal with your anger and it leads to resentment. You've just opened the back door of your life to Satan's influence. And it's that subtle. And that's where we're like, oh, the devil doesn't mess with you. He messes with you every single day. Every time you get an offended person and you don't, you don't resolve it, you've just opened the door and now he's got what? He's got you by the ankle and he's tugging on your life. And unless you're willing to acknowledge the fact that there's something going on there, you have to realize that the enemy is always at work. He's not resting. He's, he's always at work trying to get a hold of you. And that's why those kind of areas of relational maintenance are so important as a follower of Jesus to make sure that your relationships are right and pure and resolved and there's forgiveness and there's grace and there's mercy and there's reconciliation. That's how we're supposed to live. But when we don't maintain relationships, we give what the devil a foothold. We had a mouse get loose in our house one time, and I don't know where in the world it came from. We're like the cleanest people I know. If you've been to our house, you know. It's not a model house. We actually do live in it. But we live in a clean house. Kim and I are like kind of clean Nazis, I'll admit it. And so I'm like, how in the world did a mouse get into our house? And so I it had to go through lots of different versions of trying to get this mouse. I'll just be honest. The last thing that really worked good was poisoning, and I'm sorry I had to kill him, but that's the only way. He was too smart. But it took me like a week, and he kept stealing peanut butter off of traps. I mean, he was doing everything. Smart guy, but finally I got him. And I could not figure out where he came from until I went and took my car in for maintenance about three weeks later. And just in routine maintenance, they were checking the air filter, and afterwards, the mechanic came to me and he said, hey, he goes, let me show you something. And he showed me actually the whole housing for my air filter, and he opened it up, and he goes, you know what? That's a, that's a nest for a mouse. A mouse has been living in your car. I said, no. He goes, yeah, he was just camping out right there. And I'm like, no way. He was hanging out in my car and somehow got in the air filter. And then he just decided to help his way into my house. I hadn't changed the air filter in way too long. <laughs> Nobody, how many of you actually change your air filters? I mean, I know they always try to sell you on it, right? A few of you do. Most are like, oh, just let it go forever, right? I'm like, whoops. So how many times in your life has the enemy messed with you because you haven't changed your air filter? You've opened the back door. You haven't maintained relationships. I'm good. I'm fine. Then when every person that you know in relationship, you're in relationship, if they walk in the room, are you good with them? Or do you go the other way when they show up? Or in your mind, you think, oh no, why are they here? That means what? You've given the devil a foothold. And now you're having to create this false reality that you live in, which leads to the final thing. Rejecting hypocrisy means, in verse 28, you have to deal with your entitlement. So Paul says something that seems out of place, but he says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. 
what he's saying is somebody's taking something that does not belong to them. Now, it isn't somebody necessarily, is it's the thief that breaks into your house and steals something. No, it's somebody who actually takes something that doesn't belong to them because somehow in their mind, they're convinced they deserve it somehow. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. The opposite of grace is entitlement. Because entitlement says, I deserve this, therefore I take it. So what he's saying, he's talking about people who, because they're lazy or whatever their sense of entitlement, they're not going to work for what they get. They're going to actually take it because they feel somehow they're entitled to it. And somebody who's entitled is always manipulative, by the way. If you never noticed that? They always work an angle because they feel like they deserve it, but they don't want people to, they don't come right out and say, I deserve it. You just work an angle to get that to happen. We saw this happen in the pandemic. We saw how much money went to people who did not deserve it or earn it. In fact, statistics are crazy. $20 billion in fraudulent unemployment claims were applied for during the pandemic. Here's the crazy thing. In the state of California, $810 million went to names of people who are currently in prison in the California penal system. $810 million. Somebody figured out a way to sit in prison and make money. And it got repeated over and over and over. Now we're all shocked and we're all stunned. We're like, oh, that's terrible. You ever done anything, not on that scale, but have you ever taken something that really doesn't belong to you and you don't deserve? Raise your hand. <laughs> we all have. And when you do that, you have to create a false reality. And you're not going to be honest with the fact of what's going on inside you. Because when you live a life of entitlement, you don't understand grace. And if you don't get grace... You don't get God. You don't understand him because his way he relates to us is through grace, which means I'm going to give you things that you don't deserve and you can't earn, so entitlement's going to be crushed by grace. And if you don't get grace, that means you live entitled. And if you live entitled, you can't live authentic. So those are the things that Paul starts with in understanding how do we reject one side and now how do we accept the truth of reality, which is the authentic life that Jesus has for us. So verse, back to verse 25, you and I have to be willing to embrace honesty. Oh, that's easy, right? No, it's very difficult. He says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So living in an honest world is hard. Living in a world of lies is easy, because you can tell anyone you want to try to keep people happy. But here's the difference between what would be followers of Jesus in the world. We're supposed to speak truth to people because we love them so deeply we don't want them to live in a lie. In the world, we want to speak to people to make them happy so they like us. Sadly, that creeps the way into our relationships as followers of Jesus, where we end up doing that as well. But what, we're supposed, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to actually, he uses this phrase, he says, what, truth with his neighbor. Jesus said to what? Love your neighbor. Neighbor means your fellow believer, someone who's a follower of Jesus. So what does that mean? That means if we're going to live in an honest context, we're going to live in authenticity, that means we have to be willing to give and receive critique. Oh man, that's hard. Some of us are really good at giving critique, aren't we? <laughs> we're like, we see everything wrong in the world and everything wrong with the people around us. And we're not, we're willing to say it. Others of us, we don't like to do that. And, and maybe some of us are, most of us are really, it's really hard to receive critique. And the reason why is that for, that, for us, when, when we give critique, we have a default that we go to that's not motivated in love. It's motivated in judgment. Because when we pass judgment on other people, it makes us feel better about ourselves because we feel like we're just a little bit better. That's our default. That's not what this is. That's not honesty. Because honesty is, is I'm going to truly love this person to the point where what? I'm going to help them see what they can't see so they can move forward in following Jesus. Not I'm going to judge them to hold them back so I feel better. I'm just a little ahead of, the game, ahead of them in the race. And then the flip side is receiving. Man, anybody love to get up in the morning and be critiqued? No, we don't like that. It's part of following Jesus to have somebody who's close to you, knows you enough to call you on your stuff. Who can speak into your life and say, hey, you know I'm saying this because I really love you and because of that I, I need to tell you something's not right in your life. But here's, here's the problem that most of us default to. We default to an insecurity. And when someone starts to critique us about a certain part of our life and usually insecurity comes out in pride, so we, here's our extremes when we get critiqued. Pride says, oh, that's not true of me, even though you know it is. And so you get stronger and you push back harder. Insecurity goes the other side and says, if this one thing's wrong with me, then everything's wrong with me. And that means that I'm a horrible person. So if one thing is wrong, then I just might as well give up. 
But there's, there's an answer to that. If you and I are going to live honestly, here's the great thing. Is this is what, what it means to follow Jesus is we follow in his, his patterns and his rhythm of life, which is this. Jesus was humble, even though he was the God of the universe. And if you and I are humble, we're willing to accept critique. Why? Because we realize we're not perfect. But if we know that somebody loves us and they're going to speak to us about what's going on in our life, then we can accept that and we can receive that. So what? I can get rid of the costume. I can get rid of the mask. And I can be honest with my brokenness. Why? Because in my brokenness, I'm not in danger with people around me. I'm safe. The church is supposed to be a safe place for every issue for every challenge for every point of brokenness we don't get to pick and choose sins when somebody walks in the door in relationship into a church we don't get to say okay we love 99.9 percent but not you jesus never did that and that's the beauty of what of this honest true lifestyle of authenticity that we're supposed to live which leads to the second thing living authentically means embracing forgiveness so there's that second part of the concept of anger in verse 26 it says be angry and do not sin so what Paul's saying is, it's okay to be angry. It's what you do with that anger that determines everything. How do you respond to it? And I love the, the phrase, don't let the sun go down on your anger. What does that mean? Literally and figuratively, don't go to sleep angry. Don't sleep on your anger, both overnight and in your life. Because when you sleep on your anger, it becomes a lion ready to attack you and people around you. But what? It's, you're going to be angry. You're human. Jesus showed anger, but Jesus never sinned. So it's okay to be angry, but what do you do with that? You deal with it immediately. When somebody makes you angry or somebody hurts you or somebody wounds you, you don't sit on it, and you certainly don't go to somebody else and tell them how mad you are at that person. Because if you're at Antioch, you know that we have a gossip policy, and if someone comes to you and they have an issue with somebody else, you tell them to go and, and deal with that person, and you give them one week to do it. Otherwise, you help them do that by telling the other person they have an offense with them. When we do that, gossip disappears, resentment disappears, and reconciliation rules the day. That's what the church is supposed to look like, a bunch of broken people who found a way to get along because we have forgiveness and mercy towards each other. If that's the truth for us, that means that you and I have to go through our lives periodically and ask this question. Am I good in my relationships? Or am I carrying around resentment towards people in my life? None of us want to ask that question. We want to say, hey, I'm good. I'm great. But here's what I've noticed in my life. When I don't do that, it just keeps piling up. And there's this load that you carry. It's heavier and heavier and heavier. I have a backpack in my office, and that backpack is my life. It has everything in it. It has all my electronics. It has some medication that will save my life if I eat cashews, which, by the way, I'm highly allergic to, so don't ever give them to me. Otherwise, I know you hate me. But the reality is it has everything. It literally, if I lost my backpack, it has my Bible. It has my journal. So everyone's like, oh, where's Pastor John's backpack? But if I lose it, but here's what happens. Over time, I start collecting stuff in that backpack that I just keep throwing in there. And it's, one morning I'll get up and I'll pull it out of the closet. And I'm like, man, this thing is heavy. What in the world is in here? And so I, every once in a while, I will go through and I will purge my backpack. And I'll find stuff that was important to me six months ago. And I don't know why it's still in there, but I'll pull it out. And after I purge it, it gets so much lighter. But if I don't, it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And that's the life that I live. And that's true with our anger. If we don't deal with it, we're just carrying around this backpack that just keeps weighing us down over and over and over again. And we're miserable. We're not even fun to be around anymore. Why? Because we're so weighed down with the resentment that we hold towards other people. So in order to embrace the concept of forgiveness, you and I have to unpack our backpack. We have to be willing to extend the forgiveness to other people around us when they fail us, because they will. And then the third thing is this. If we're going to live authentically, we have to embrace unity so Paul goes on, he says, be angry, do not sin. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give an opportunity to the devil. So here's the key. In fact, I'm reading a book recently by Francis Chan and I'm having difficulty getting through it because it's about unity and I realize how far, how far I've fallen short from living in unity with brothers and sisters. Unity is one of the primary things that Jesus talks about in his last words before he goes back to the Father. But unity is very difficult because unity is amongst a bunch of broken people. But unity is what breathes life into the body of Christ. It's what breathes the kind of life that Jesus wants in us. It gives potential for what God wants to do in people's lives when we are together. So the primary, the primary technique, the primary weapon of the enemy is offense. It's anger towards each other. So if we're to live in unity, then we have to go after that. 
We have to live in unity, which means we have to love each other, which means that when we get offended, you just don't get to walk away. That's not the body of Christ. When we get offended, we do different than the world we live in. We deal with it. We live authentically, not as a hypocrite. Because it's easy, and we're all guilty of this. I know I'm guilty of this. Something happens, you get offended, there's a wedge in a relationship, and instead of working through it, you sever the relationship. And you never even want to go back there. You don't even want to talk to that person, you want to deal with that person. But what you've just done is you've stifled in you and that person some of the potential of what God wants to bring in their life through relationship with you in this thing called unity. There's life left in broken relationships that we walk away from. I told you this story before, but we had an apricot tree in our backyard. I broke one of the main branches when it was really small with my basketball, and I freaked out because I thought, oh, I'm getting in trouble for this. I've broken the apricot tree. It's not going to grow. So not knowing what I was doing, I found a rope, and I tied that limb back onto the trunk as tight as I could and prayed it would survive and watered and watered and watered that tree like crazy. Guess what happened? the branch mended itself back into the trunk. And I watched the tree grow, and I remember when, when I finally left that house, I could still go back to that tree, and there's still little tiny threads of rope right where this branch connects to the trunk. That, tr that branch produced apricots, it produced leaves, it obviously had life left into it. But there was a part of me that when I first broke it off, I thought I just should break it off and throw it in the trash. But there was life left into it. How many times in a relationship something gets broken and you're like, I'm done, I'm out. Here's the hard part about this, two things. If Jesus forgave us for what we've done, the least we can do is forgive each other for what we've done to each other. The second thing is, I'm convinced heaven's gonna be great, but it's gonna be hard. Because you're gonna walk in the door and you're gonna see some people who followed Jesus in their life and you had a fractured relationship with. And guess what? I don't think there's going to be any resentment and anger and offense in heaven. You're going to have to deal with it. So better to deal with it now than later. Because there's life left in our relationships. There's life left in the body of Christ when we are connected. Which leads to the final thing. To live authentically means we have to embrace Generosity. So again, going back to that sense of entitlement. So Paul says this in verse 28. He says, doing honest work with his, hand, his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So again, it's, it's taking off this falsehood that says I create a false reality so I can get what I want. I can manipulate other people because I have a sense of entitlement. I go to the opposite side of that, which means I earn something for myself because I want to have the capacity to give something away to somebody else. That's not the world that we live in. The world that we live in manipulates situations to benefit ourselves. So the truth that God gives us to live different than the world is what? Is that I earn a living or I do something or I work hard not so I could actually pad my bank account or make myself feel good or add and accumulate stuff for my life, but I do it in such a way so that I can live a generous life. Why? Because authenticity in the body of Christ means that I care about other people and their needs, not just my own. That is different. That's revolutionary for our culture. To actually genuinely love other people. And this is one of the things I've been grappling with. I've been reading a devotional, which I normally don't do, but it's based on a book called Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. Excellent book, highly recommend. Not an easy read. But one of the things that Dallas Willard says is if you truly love somebody, you need nothing from them. Just let that settle in for a moment. How many people in your life do you genuinely love then? Now, it doesn't mean that you don't get anything from somebody, but it means that I love them enough that I don't need something in return when I show love to them. That's the way that Jesus doesn't need us to love him, but he loves us. So I just got really quiet. You're like, oh man, I don't know about that, Pastor John. I, I, yeah, apply that to your spouse. Do you love your spouse unconditionally or do you love for what they give you? If husband and wife in a marriage both love the other, the other person without needing anything, that is a beautiful marriage. Because then everything is a gift. It's not entitlement. So what's going on here is this reality that I have the capacity in the, the eyes that God sees me for the body of Christ and the world around me to realize other people have needs. And so if they have needs and I need to do something to make sure that their needs are met, that I have something to give. Okay, confession time. Most of you know me know I love my grass. 
Not the stuff you smoke, the stuff that's in my front yard, okay? Like, Pastor John, I never knew, right? No, I love to mow my grass, maintain it, water it, make sure it's green, right? Nick's my neighbor, he knows, he knows. We talk about it all the time. This drought is killing me. Literally, it's killing me. Because when they came out with the water restriction to water once a week, I'm going to just tell you, and this is the internal dialogue, the last time I was mowing my lawn, about a, six weeks ago, because it doesn't need it now, I'm justifying in my head how I can get around that requirement. If I water in the middle of the night and it dries up enough, no one's going to know the next morning that I watered that night, not just Saturdays. Anybody want to admit that you're in that boat too? Come on, people. I know you are. I see how green your grass is. Come on. I drive around the town. But I'm having this dialogue in my head. Seriously, I'm mowing the lawn. I'm like, I can't let this die. I love doing this. It's like therapeutic for me every Saturday. And then I started to think, we're in a drought. In fact, one of my friends from Africa once said they can't get over all the green grass in the front yard because why do you guys water something that doesn't produce anything? You can't eat it. Why are you watering it? So I'm worrying about the look of my grass and I'm thinking, man, if I could work around, the Lord stopped me literally and said, really? You're more concerned with the appearance of your grass than if someone's going to have enough water to drink someday. Or to irrigate, irrigate fields, they're going to grow crops so that people have something to eat. You're so worried about your grass being green, and I remembered, okay, Lord, I'm going to have to let this thing die. And so, I am. I'm watering on Saturdays only like I'm supposed to with the odd ending of my address. Now, I'm not saying that to, to, to throw shame on anybody, but I realized that in my selfishness, I wasn't caring about one of the most basic needs other than air people have, water. And if I'm willing, up, willing to give up a gra my grass so that it dies and looks ugly for a while so that someone else can drink and someone else can eat, that's the least I should do. Where are those moments where God wakes you up to the reality of what you're grappling over and what you want for yourself and what people around you actually need? Because if you're a follower of Jesus, what we're supposed to what? Be generous with our resources and our time and our relationships and everything that we have. We're supposed to be generous, which is different than the world. Jesus was generous with his life. He gave up his life for us. So with this being said, so there's a, there's a trans, transformation that happens in our lives that we awaken to this reality. There's something different that God has for my life. A different truth than the reality of the culture that we live in. And that's what we're supposed to live. It's that Zacchaeus moment where you're confronted with who Jesus is. And it isn't that he gives you the script of how to change. It's that you spontaneously respond in this way. My life needs to be different. So what areas do I begin to address? How do I deal with that? So I want to close with this because we've been, and we will throughout this series, but if you were here last week, we talked about it, and even the week before. When we strive to live a different life, it's, it's part of this reality that God gives us a different identity than we live out of that identity. But there's choices you and I make every single day. Will I live into the identity that's different or will I buy into the same old story I've been living? And it always comes down to this. I said this before, and I'll say it over and over again. This is what I've learned in following Jesus. It's not about working harder. It's about surrendering more. That's it. It isn't that Jesus looks at it and says, man, you just got to buck up. You got to work harder. No, it's about surrendering more of who I am. And Jesus puts it this way. If you want to experience life, what do you have to do? You have to die. If you want life, you have to die first. So that's overwhelming. Didn't you think about, man, I have to die? And I've, I've thought that I've argued with that concept in my life. What does it look like to die to myself so I can truly follow Jesus? That is overwhelming. You mean give up everything and just walk away from everything and be dead to everything? I don't know if I could do that, but I know one thing I can do. And somebody once said this, it's not that you have to die in one day, it's that you die a little every day. I can do that. I can die a little bit to myself every single day. In whatever area that is, I can die to my flesh, I can die to what I think I need, I can die to my selfishness, I can do a little, if I can do one point of death every day, eventually I will be dead and then I will be alive. So what is it that God's calling you to die to? It doesn't have to be everything. It can be one thing. But each day you live out that one thing. Today I'm going to die to this area of my life. It might be as simple as I'm not going to, I'm going to let this person cut in front of me on the road even though they don't have the right to cut in front of me. It could be I'm going to do something for my spouse that I don't normally do because it's their responsibility in keeping in with our house. Maybe it's something that you do for a coworker that you really don't like them and your flesh says don't treat them nice but you do something nice for them. That's a little bit of dying every single 
day. That's what it is to eventually become different, is that eventually all of us dies, the old dies. The falsehood that Paul's talking about is what? Put off. So what's left is the authentic person that God created us to be. So would you close your eyes? I'm going to pray and we'll, we'll conclude today. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for challenging us and demonstrating for us and then giving us an identity that allows us to be different. Lord, we know that we, we can't work up this thing called being different on our own. We know that it's something that we have to surrender and submit to you. So Lord, specifically today, I pray for each one of us that you would highlight. Lord, last week we used the analogy being willing to give up the beer to get the baseball. This, this week, Lord, it's, we need to find ways to die to ourselves just a little bit every day. So Lord, I pray today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all the way through the week. When we wake in the morning, would you remind us that Lord, today is about experiencing a little bit more life because we're willing to die a little bit more to ourselves. And as we do that, Lord, we would begin to remove the mask, take off the costume, reject the hypocrisy, Lord, that maybe we've lived in and begin to live authentically before you. And I'm just gonna pause just with eyes closed for, for a couple really important things. That there's two things I really feel like we're supposed to highlight. The first one is this. There are people here that you know that you are living in hypocrisy. You are living some kind of a lie that you've lived into in such a way that you know that you're creating a false narrative for people around you to believe about you and you know it's not true, but you don't know how to get out of it. You don't know how to walk away from it. You don't know how to, to reveal it so that, that you, your, your fear is if you actually become authentic that people will reject you. And so you continue to perpetuate the lie every single day. Jesus wants you to know that his grace is sufficient for your life. His mercy and his forgiveness comes to you when you're authentic because part of the journey to authenticity is confessing the sin that you're living in in secret and bringing it into the light so that God can deal with it in your life. If that's you today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you to do something. I'm gonna challenge you to come clean with one person. To find somebody you trust to say, hey, I just want you to know I've been living a lie in this area and I don't want to live in that darkness anymore. I don't want to live in the shadows. I want to step into the light. I want to deal with that thing. And I'm confessing it to you. Would you pray with me? It could be somebody who's here. It could be a trusted friend that you have. I'm going to stick around after service. If you want me to pray with you, I'll do that as well. We have other leaders I could point you to. But secondly, that you're here and, and there's something in you that longs for an authentic life, but you know you're stuck in a lie you're stuck in hypocrisy and you feel like you're, you're constantly spinning plates all the time in your life. You're trying to keep all the plates from crashing to the ground and it's exhausting because you know that at the core of who you are, you're not living out who you're really supposed to be. And the reason is, is because you've tried to live your life on your own apart from the one who created you. His name is Jesus and he knows you better than you know yourself. And if you have never surrendered your life to say, I make a commitment to follow him, to trust in him, because here's the beauty of what he did. When he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, what he did was he took all the hypocrisy, he took the costume, he took the mask, he took all the lies that we create, and he crucified them. He forgave them so that we could let them go and not pay the penalty for those things in our lives. And so he can set you free today from the lie that you've lived. And if that's your desire, I'm gonna pray again in a moment. I'm gonna ask you to pray. And that is you can think thoughts and you can speak words because God hears your thoughts and knows your words. That you would say, I surrender to you, Jesus, today to step beyond the shadows, to take off the mask, to move beyond the costume, to live authentically with the stuff in my life that I know I need to deal with as I choose to follow you. So Jesus, if it's us living out a lie as a follower of you that we need to step out of, give us the courage to confess and confide in others today. And if, Lord, if it's those who've maybe never made that decision to surrender their life to you today, would you give them the courage right now, even as they pray and begin to think and speak to you about surrendering their lives, Lord, as you tell us, if we confess our sin, if we're honest and authentic, you are faithful and just and will forgive us for all the brokenness in our life and you will cleanse us and make us right and pure in relationship with you. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're at work today in those things. Now give us the ability and the courage and the faithfulness and determination to live that out in our lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen.